Welcome to the Library Seminars, a platform for the presentation of ideas, research, and news in support of NOAA's mission. I am Lisa Clark, Reference Librarian at the NOAA Central Library. Today's seminar is the Woods Hole Assessment Model, WAM, a general state space assessment framework. The presentation is part of the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar Series, which is developed by NOAA Fisheries and organized by Kristen Blackheart. Our speaker today is Dr. Brian Stock from Ocean Associates, Inc. He develops statistical methods to improve our understanding and management of fisheries. He's highly motivated by projects that combine population dynamics modeling with fields and lab-based research into biological processes. He completed his PhD with Dr. Bryce Themmins at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UC San Diego, and currently works with Dr. Tim Miller at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center on WAM. Tim will be joining Brian for the question and answer session after the presentation. Before I hand the mic over to Brian, here are just a few logistical tips to help you enjoy your presentation. If you're having trouble with the audio or visual components of GoToWebinar, please log out and rejoin us. This resets the software and resolves most technical issues. Our presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel as well as the Library Seminars website by tomorrow morning. We will also be accepting questions throughout the seminar, which Brian and Tim will address at the end of their presentation. Please feel free to type your questions in the questions chat box on the right side of your screen at any time. Also, if you're interested in the slides from today's presentation, you can download them from the drop down menu on the right under handouts. So with that last detail, let's start the seminar. Thank you, and the screen is all yours, Brian. Brian. All right, well, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to the organizers for having me. I'm excited to share um, what I've been working on with Tim Miller at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Uh, we're calling it WAM, or the Woods Hole Assessment Model. It's a general state-based framework and software package for fitting uh, fishery stock assessment models. Uh, this slide is my attempt to summarize everything in just one slide. So if it doesn't make sense, don't fear. All will be made clear later. But if this does make sense to you, hopefully it's helpful to have it in one place. Um, so we are in the Northeast, um, where most age-based uh, assessments are conducted using ASAP, which is a traditional uh, statistical catch-at-age model. It's written in ADMB. Uh, and at its heart, WAM is a recoding of ASAP in R and TMB. It's an R package, uh, which you can load, and then there's functions to read in ASAP data files, uh, set up the WAM model by uh, specifying random effects options, uh, fit the model uh, using TMB. And then uh, the main uh, advancement that WAM makes over ASAP is the ability to estimate time and age varying random effects. Uh, so you'll see a lot of plots like this one where the x-axis is the year and the y-axis is the age and these are deviations of random effects uh, where positives are in red and negatives are in blue um, wham also includes the ability to estimate environmental links to uh, time varying productivity uh, or not uh, and then one of the nice parts about uh, this approach is that projections are handled um, nice, uh, very naturally with random effects. Uh, and then many of these models have uh, reduced retrospective patterns. So that was WAM in a nutshell. Let's take it back about uh, 10 steps and answer what is a state space model. Uh, so most uh, age based fisheries assessment models are at their core, keeping track of the numbers of, each, uh, numbers of fish in each age in each year. That's N sub A sub Y. Uh, and then the model has to define uh, how the numbers at each age transition from one year to the next. Uh, you can think of these as survival. So it's uh, defining how the numbers at age uh, one, say, in year one, become the numbers at age two in year two, and the numbers at age three in year three. And that uh, survival function depends on the parameters, uh, natural mortality, uh, fishing mortality, selectivity, and then we fit the model. We're finding the most likely parameter values given our data um, from catch and survey, uh, catch and surveys in the indices of abundance. 
So a statistical catch at age model like ASAP or stock synthesis um, will, it treats the numbers at age um, as a deterministic uh, function of the numbers in the previous age in the previous year. Um, and this function is uh, determined by those parameters, uh, natural mortality, fishing mortality, and selectivity. Uh, something of a hybrid, this next model, is a statistical catch at age model that estimates recruitment as random effects. Uh, recruitment is the numbers in age one, uh, and they're estimated as random effects with some variant sigma r. Uh, then what we're calling a full state space model is where the numbers at all ages are treated as random effects, uh, where the mean is the same uh, survival function that, um, but then they're allowed to be some variation uh, with the variance sigma a. Um, so where does the the state space name come from? It comes from the fact that we're treating the numbers at age as an unobserved process or state variable. Um, and here on the left, I've just um, shown how state space models distinguish between uh, process and observation error. And in WAM, the um, processes or the process variables can be numbers at age, uh, mortality, selectivity, and environmental covariates. And the models fit to uh, the, the likelihood has observation components uh, for the total catch from the fishery and the survey, uh, age composition from the fishery and the survey, and environmental data. All right, so now uh, Tim and I are working at the Northeast and it's uh, useful to have some background on assessments in the Northeast. So the Northeast Center is responsible for assessing um, fish stocks from about Cape Hatteras uh, up to the Canadian border. Uh, here we are in Woods Hole at the Star. Um, about half of the assessments are age-based and of those the majority use ASAP or the Age Structured Assessment Program, like I said, written in ADMB. Um, many of the stocks that are assessed uh, with age-based models are groundfish with a few pelagics. Uh, a lot of them have a long history of exploitation with uh, quite high fishing mortality. And a lot of the assessments use empirical weighted age data. Um, which is in contrast to say uh, on the West Coast where it's more common to fit growth um, uh, within the model. Useful distinction can be made between management and research track assessments. So management track assessments are used for operational uh, setting catch advice. They're conducted uh, every two years or so, often using ASAP uh, in our region. Uh, versus a research track that formerly were called benchmarks where uh, larger, more structural changes are considered that are conducted on a much, uh, much less often. And of note, there is planned to be a, a general research track assessment in 2023 to evaluate the possibility of using state space models such as WAM uh, or SAM uh, as management uh, assessment models. And then the last thing to note um, about the Northeast region is that many of the assessments have um, significant retrospective patterns, often uh, like this plot shows uh, positive uh, retrospective patterns for spawning biomass. What that means is that there's some uh, misspecification in the model that's causing the model to overestimate biomass, which is a, a serious management concern. So um, taking all that in mind, uh, one of the main objectives in the Northeast is to develop a state space model. Uh, some of this is motivated by work done by the ICES uh, working groups uh, in one analysis where they compared uh, traditional statistical catch at age models with state space models. They found that um, across a number of stocks, uh, state space models have tended to have a less retrospective pattern, uh, lower AIC, and uh, larger uncertainty in estimates of biomass. Uh, a second objective is to incorporate uh, time-varying productivity uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that the Northeast region um, has been rapidly warming, um, more so than the global average even. Uh, and this warming has 
particularly been pronounced in the last 20 years or so. Um, so one priority is to uh, develop stock assessment models that include uh, environmental terms to account for time varying productivity. Um, it's a useful distinction can be made between two different ways of, of allowing for time varying productivity. And in this, I'm um, taking this from a paper led by Andre Punt, 2014. Uh, the first is uh, mechanistic. So this is where you're directly estimating an effect of an environmental variable on a population dynamic process. Uh, Tim Miller and colleagues have published a few of these examples in the last few years. Um, starting on the left, this is a uh, yellowtail flounder uh, where they've tied uh, recruitment to environmental indices like the cold pool and the Gulf Stream. Uh, in the middle, we have a, an Atlantic cod where they tied growth and maturity to bottom temperature. And on the right, we have a summer flounder where they've tied natural mortality to and recruitment to the Gulf Stream. Uh, the second approach to allowing for time burning productivity uh, can be called empirical. It's whereas the mechanistic approach is more of a, a biological solution to the problem, uh, the empirical approach you can think of as a statistical solution to the problem, uh, where you're not actually estimating any environmental effect, but you're simply allowing uh, productivity parameters such as natural mortality uh, to change over time. So this example is taken for. Gulf of Maine cod. Um, and in the assessment, um, there's concerns that uh, M may have increased. So what one, one thing that they've done is this M ramp, M ramp model, where they have the uh, natural mortality start at 0 0.2, uh, and then uh, linearly increases to 0 0.4, and then stays at that level. Uh, an alternative, and this is an example um, done using WAM, is to allow uh, time varying mortality as a uh, autocorrelated process where you estimate uh, in this example here um, keeping the, the mean or the initial uh, m fixed at 0 0.2 but estimating parameters for the correlation between um, m in different years and a variance that allows m to, to increase over time in a smooth fashion similar to uh, the MRAP model. Uh, so the main objectives uh, for WAM in the Northeast are to develop, develop it as a state-based model uh, and to allow for time-varying productivity via two different approaches. One, uh, mechanistic with environmental links directly on uh, productivity parameters, and two, the uh, empirical or statistical approach of allowing time, varying, uh, time variation without environmental links. And then uh, lastly, we want this to be all in one framework so that we can easily uh, test um, models with these effects against status quo models in ASAP that, um, that don't have these effects. Um, so Tim and I are happy to announce that WAM, uh, we're considering it ready to use. Uh, we've released a version one. You can find it on the NOAA Fisheries Toolbox or at this site. Um, we have a paper in revision uh, that has more details on the model description as well as simulation tests for five stocks. Uh, hopefully that'll be out uh, in the next month or two. And we've also spent a fair bit of effort to develop a website with some uh, more documentation and testing of the code. Uh, and the website for that uh, is there. All right, so that was um, kind of, that was part one of the talk. The second part of the talk, um, I'd like to go into some research highlights that we've um, and showing off what WAM can do as opposed to just what WAM is and why we built it. Um, so the first section is on uh, 2D autocorrelation in, uh, by age and year. I'll show you some um, results using of models using that and how the projections and retrospective patterns are impacted, uh, as well as showing how we can simultaneously estimate random effects on both numbers at age and natural mortality, uh, and as well as 2D autocorrelation and selectivity. Uh, and then the, the last two points are following that um, in, uh, mechanistic approach where we have uh, recruitment that's impacted by an effect of a cold pool and natural mortality with uh, temperature effects. Okay, so uh, 2D autocorrelation by age and year, it's motivated by 
the fact that biological processes are often correlated by year and age. So things like in an assessment model, we have survival, recruitment, natural mortality, selectivity, growth, maturity, fecundity. So those bottom three, bottom three are currently treated as fixed in WAM, but we can estimate uh, 2D autocorrelation on the top four. Um, and just a reminder, this is that empirical approach we're allowing uh, ver uh, processes to vary in time, but without uh, an environmental link. Uh, these are the five different um, codes that, that WAM uses um, to, do, to set up different uh, random effects models. Uh, so the first would be to have no, no deviations at all, have a time constant, which doesn't estimate any additional parameters. Um, the second is uh, IID, or independent identically distributed, where you estimate one additional uh, variance parameter, but there's no correlation by age or year. Uh, and the next option is AR1, say uh, correlated across ages. So this adds one more parameter, a correlation across age. Uh, you can also estimate a model with uh, an AR1, autoregressive one, where there's correlation across years, but not ages, uh, which also has two parameters. And then we have the, the full model, which is a 2D AR1, where there's correlation across both ages and years, and that estimates three fixed effect parameters. Uh, and then this is the covariance function that we use. Uh, we note that there are other ways that you could um, set up the covariance. For example, SAM has more options for, for how to do this. Uh, this is uh, the one option that we currently have for, for 2D uh, correlation where the um, nearby ages and years are more correlated. So for example, uh, age two and age three are gonna have a higher correlation than age two and age five and likewise for years. So now um, here's a set of models that makes sense to look at for if your numbers at age or your survival transitions are um, the random process. Uh, the first I'm going to call base, which is like a statistical catch at age model where all recruitment deviations are estimated as uh, independent fixed effect parameters. Um, so you have to estimate number of years minus one is the number of parameters. Um, the next model is similar to a statistical catch at age, but instead of fixed effects, we're going to estimate ran um, random deviations random recruitment deviations uh, as independent random effects. Uh, so we have to estimate uh, the sigma R term. Uh, the next model is similar, but just adds uh, autocorrelation by year. Uh, and then the bottom two are what I called full state space models, where the numbers at all ages um, are treated uh, as a, a process or state variable. Um, so NAA3 will have independent deviations uh, for all ages. And then the, the last model also includes that two-dimensional autocorrelation by age and year. So we have uh, four parameters, the uh, recruitment variance, uh, variance of the all of the ages above age one are treated as having the same variance, and then correlation in age and year. So um, if equations are um, equations are nice, but I think the pictures will sh demonstrate how, how these models work a little bit uh, more intuitively. Um, so this is an example from uh, Yellowtail Flounder, uh, where I have those five models that are fit. And again, uh, the x-axis is uh, year, the y-axis is age, and these are the survival transitions where red is positive and blue is negative. Um, first thing I'd like to highlight is that the models that treat recruitment deviations as random effects or fixed effects are estimating very similar recruitment. That's almost uh, indistinguishable by I at least. Um, so that is, uh, these are deviations, these are uh, the age one or recruitment deviations. Um, second thing to note is that the models with the um, correlation by year and or age are smoothing those um, deviations. So you may have to squint, maybe you can't see this, maybe you can, but there's some smoothing here if you compare these two models in the recruitments. In the recruitments. 
Um, it's a little bit easier to see in the bottom right here if you compare the independent um, deviations um, versus the one the, versus the model that has uh, 2D um, autocorrelation by age and year. Uh, third point is that the models that add autocorrelation by year don't affect the deviations much in the model years, but they do affect the projection. So the uh, vertical dashed line here is the terminal year of the assessment, last year of data, and anything to the right is the projection. So um, where these two models differ is that um, if you assume, or like, and you specify in your model that there's autocorrelation by year, then in the projection period, these negative uh, recruitment deviations are propagated into the projections. Whereas if the recruitment deviations are independent, like here, um, you estimate that there's no deviation in the projection period. Um, and the same thing happens for the state-based models where you have correlation by uh, age and year, you end up having survival deviations for not only age one, but also age two and age three that are negative. Um, and this, um, for example, for this example of yellowtail flounder, where the proportion of uh, mature fish reaches, uh, it, most fish become mature by age three, um, the spawning biomass will be impacted in the projection period by having not only age one deviations uh, being negative, but also um, ages two and three. And, and here you can see that in these plots of the projected biomass comparing um, the models with and without autocorrelation. So uh, the two state-based models are shown in yellow and in gray. Um, they have similar um, estimates of uh, biomass in the model years, but they differ in the projections where the model with autocorrelation had negative survival deviations in the projection period, and that's why the projected biomass is lower. Uh, another thing to point out from this example is that the state space models both had higher uncertainty in the biomass. Um, and then this is not just for yellowtail flounder, but across uh, the five stocks that we use to simulation test WAM, uh, the state space models and especially the state space model with the 2D AR1 process um, had reduced retrospective patterns. So that's what these these panels are showing you uh, at left is the retrospective pattern for recruitment. Uh, in the center is spawning biomass, and at right is fishing mortality. And these box plots are um, showing the results across those five stocks. And that, in general, um, all of these are um, all of these have a lower Mons row than the base model, and there's a further reduction. Uh, when you add the 2D AR1 um, autocorrelation to the uh, state space model that had independent deviations. Uh, and then the last thing is that they um, have also had uh, lower AIC. So this is kind of the main takeaway of the, the two papers that um, should be coming out soon in fisheries research. Um, some of the overachievers out there may be wondering um, whether you can estimate random effects simultaneously on numbers at age uh, transitions and natural mortality. And this is, I don't wanna get into the details of the slide, but this is just to say that uh, yes, you can, at least for uh, the couple stocks that we've looked at, you can estimate um, random effect deviations on both numbers at age transitions and uh, natural mortality. Uh, and then the last thing I'd like to highlight with the 2D AR1 um, deviations is that um, just an example where we've um, estimated that model for on selectivity. Uh, this is an example from George's Bank Haddock. Um, three models. Uh, in the, on the top, we have a, a model that's just estimating uh, time constant selectivity. So there are two parameters. This is uh, using logistic selectivity. So there's, there's two parameters. Um, these bars are, are the same color for all years because there's just one selectivity for each age that's estimated, but it's constant across years. The second model allows deviations in those parameters independently for every year. 
uh, and you can see that um, there's some evidence of selectivity at ages two, three, and four um, being lower in recent years compared to earlier years. And then the last model adds that 2D autocorrelation uh, to the selectivity parameters. So there's correlation between the two logistic parameters as well as correlation across year. And it produces a selectivity pattern that's similar to the one from model two. It's just smoothed. All right, so those were all examples of WAMS capabilities um, of using that empirical approach of, or statistical approach to allowing time variation and productivity. Um, and now, now I'm going to show you some examples of uh, how WAM uses that mechanistic approach, estimating specific environment productivity um, links. Um, and this example comes from yellowtail flounder, where there's been a long hypothesized temperature effect on recruitment um, dating back to the 50s. Uh, the plot at the left shows how yellowtail catch has been uh, lower in, in, in warmer periods. Uh, which is uh, denoted by this uh, red. The red and blue bars are just denoting uh, cooler and warmer periods. And, and catch uh, declined in the 40s and 50s, which was also a period of warm temperatures, and since uh, the late 70s has also declined. That hypothesis has since been refined as not just being related to temperature, but to uh, this cold pool, which, as you might expect, is a, a feature of cold water that forms in winter and then in subsurface in the summer and fall. Uh, and Yelto founder are a recruit to it. Um, so in this example, uh, here's how WAM uh, actually fits data, fits the cold pool environmental data uh, within the assessment model. Uh, there's two options for the, the process. Either cold pool can be treated as a random walk or as a AR1, autoregressive one uh, process. And so then uh, with the addition of, of these uh, estimating the observation and process errors, um, then we have <clears throat> we end up with an estimate of the cold pool within the assessment, that's X, uh, X of T. We also have a few different options implemented for how to handle observation error. Um, which you can look at, the details are, are online. Um, once we have the estimated cold pool within the assessment with observation and process error, now we have to link that somehow to the population. So for recruitment, there's a number of different ways you could have environmental covariate influence uh, the expected recruitment. Uh, it all it depends on how you're actually modeling recruitment, whether you have uh, treating recruitment as a random walk, uh, just random about a mean, um, whether you use a stock recruitment relationship like Beverton Holt or Ricker. There are multiple ways of including, um, of having the cold pool influence expected recruitment. Um, here's an example of, uh, of how WAM fits that environmental data with both observation and process error. Uh, so here, the actual cold pool data or the observations are the dots, and the um, the estimated observation error input to the model is fixed are the uh, lines, and then the the colored like thick line is the model estimated cold pool within the assessment, and then the gray um, the gray shading is the 95% uh, confidence interval for the modeled cold pool within the assessment. And a couple things to point out is that during this uh, period of higher observation error, so these larger, um, larger confidence intervals for the data, the model also includes a, a larger confidence interval for the cold pool, as in higher shading. Uh, and then it also highlights how um, the state-space model very naturally estimates the process even when there's years of missing data. So in 2017, the bottom trawl survey um, didn't sample all stations, and so there's no, um, there wasn't an estimate of the cold pool in 2017 from those uh, temperature from the bottom trawl survey. Uh, and you can see that the, um, the model naturally provides an estimate 
of what that uh, cold pool was, as well as increased uncertainty um, because there's no data from 2017. Uh, and then, and then we can um, fit those different or fit the effect of the cold pool on the recruitment in different ways. And within one framework, it's quite nice because then you can uh, compare the, uh, the models based on AIC. You can also compare them based on uh, Mohn's row or the retrospective pattern. Um, and then this is just highlighting uh, the stock recruit relationship if you assume that there's no effect of the cold pool uh, versus if you assume that there is an effect of the cold pool. This is showing that at, uh, at higher cold pool values, the um, estimated or the uh, predicted recruitment is quite low, um, whereas at uh, lower cold pool values with more cold water, sorry. Um, there, the recruitment is quite a bit higher, expected to be quite a bit higher. So that's all well and good. One uh, then nice thing about treating the environmental data as a random effect is how it's handled in the projection. So there's options for just continuing the random walker AR1 process uh, for using uh, an average value or using the last value. Uh, we can also specify the value in the projection period. And this is um, of interest because this is where you could potentially uh, input climate forecasts. You could do uh, simulations, um, testing what the effect would be of different uh, environmental conditions in the future. All right, and then the last example I have for you is um, including a temperature effect on natural mortality. Um, this is a very preliminary work looking at uh, Gulf of Maine cod. In, uh, in 2015, there was a, a paper published in Science that claimed that the um, failure of the assessment to include temperature effects led to the collapse of the Gulf of Maine cod fishery. Um, they specifically claimed that H4M increases as fall temperature increases that recruitment declines as summer temperature increases, that failure to incorporate these temperature effects in the assessment led to uh, over-optimistic catch advice and overfishing, and that rebuilding depends on temperature now as much as actual fishing uh, mortality. Uh, this analysis had a couple of flaws that um, led to not one, but two technical comments, uh, replies in the literature. Um, but what everyone could agree on is that um, it would be better to uh, actually test for these effects within the assessment model. Um, so that was one of the main methodological uh, critiques of this paper. And now WAM is, WAM is set up so that we can do this quite easily, um, looking at temperature effects on both uh, natural mortality and recruitment. And I'm just using it as an example here to show you um, the breadth of the different um, effects you could estimate on natural mortality. So uh, all of these different boxes are different models showing the pattern in estimated mortality by age and by year, where again, the x-axis is year, uh, the y-axis is age. Um, M1 is the the status quo, so fix M at all ages at all years at 0 0.2. Uh, this next model just estimates uh, mean M across all ages and years, which estimates it um, higher than 0 0.2. Uh, a third model estimates, uh, keeps M fixed at 0 0.2 for all ages except for age four, uh, which is estimated. Uh, and then another possibility um, that makes biological sense is um, just based on the fact that uh, generally larger things in the ocean have lower mortality. You might expect to tie um, natural mortality to the weight. So therefore it decreases as a function of age. So th this model uh, estimates M as a function of weight. Um, and you can see that there's the M decreases uh, as a function of age. And then you can also add different time effects. So uh, this next column adds uh, temperature effects to um, the previous column. 
So these uh, vertical lines are showing that um, this, the same effect across all ages is being estimated, um, but it's changing by year based on what the temperature was in that year. So this model fixes uh, the mean, mean M at 0 0.2, but allows time variation based on the temperature. Uh, this model estimates the mean M and also adds the temperature effect, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then this is the model I showed you before, where uh, M changes in time as an autocorrelated process. Uh, and then this one estimates um, deviations by age and year independently. Uh, and then here's just focusing on the models that uh, treat all ages equally, only allowing variation in time, just to compare what they estimate relative to what's used in the assessment. Uh, so the two models that are used in the assessment are this uh, dashed line that just keeps M fixed at 0 0.2, and then the M ramp that starts at 0 0.2 and then increases to 0 0.4. Um, this pink line is the one I showed before that uh, treats M as an AR1 process. And then these more jaggedy lines are the ones that add uh, effects of temperature. And this is just to show um, that they're all roughly similar. Um, and uh, just some, some of the, the various options that, that WAM can estimate. So then, uh, like I said, this is very preliminary. Uh, we don't have results yet, but um, the question now is, did using the M1 or the MRAMP model in the assessment actually lead to overfishing? And I think to, to really answer this, you'd have to do a management strategy evaluation where you uh, peel back years of data, um, simulate using uh, one of these as an operating model and, then, um, and also as an estimation model to see if you can estimate those models and um, see if, if that would have made a difference. So if all of that sounded interesting, then I'd encourage you, encourage you to go and check out the website. We have a uh, number of vignettes that are written on the basics on how to uh, input random effects on recruitment, how to handle uh, different options for the projection, selectivity, natural mortality, survival, and then a short one on debugging models. Um, the basic idea uh, behind WAM uh, the first thing you'd have to do is install it. Um, so it's, it's on GitHub, so you can use install GitHub. That'll in, uh, compile the, the TMB, the CPP file. Uh, then you can load it. Uh, then there's a function to read in an ASAP data file. And we have not done a lot of work to um, document how to create an ASAP3 data file that, that might be coming. Uh, the prepare WAM input function will allow you to include ran the random effects options that are in WAM but not that weren't in ASAP. And then the fit WAM uh, function will actually run the model in TMB. There's a number of options with, with how to do that. There's also this useful do.fit equals false you can use for debugging. Um, and then you can plot, we have functions for plotting output, checking convergence, um, comparing a list of uh, multiple fit models. You'll notice that the output looks a lot like R4SS. It's because we ripped off <laughs> R4SS, so thank you. Uh, we're happy to help out. Um, not that many people besides Tim and I have been using WAM. Um, so if you would like to, please, uh, and would need some help maybe or have questions, please use the, the issues, issues page on GitHub, and we'll get back to you. Uh, just to recap, it's currently designed for uh, single species stock assessment with age structured data uh, with empirical weighted age. Um, so there's no length, uh, sorry, to crustaceans or uh, the West Coast who wants to fit growth. Um, optional um, would be if you have a clear mechanistic hypothesis about environmental variable that drives uh, uh, population dynamics process, you can include environmental data. Um, some some plan work that we're um, we're working on now. Uh, we're looking at adding some MSE capability, um, potentially some different environmental covariate models, uh, effects on other biological processes like uh, catchability or growth. Uh, we are working on applications to some specific stocks. I mentioned the one on cod, uh, also winter flounder and black sea bass. 
Um, we're also interested in trying to fit multivariate spatial environmental data within WAM. Uh, and then the Alaska Fisheries Science Center is leading an effort to incorporate fitting age length and, and length weight data to incorporate growth into the model. Um, so with that, I have people to thank. I um, did most of this work as an NRC postdoc with Tim Miller. I was funded by the NOAA Fisheries and Environment FATE program. Um, also been funded by the Northeast Center of Climate and Fisheries. Um, um, some co-authors that needed to be thanked are Haikun, uh, Jim, and Janet, uh, as well as guinea pigs that have submitted issues and used WAM, uh, Chris Legault, Chuck Adams, Justin Marr, and uh, Jim Ianelli. And with that, I would like to thank you for listening, and we'll take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for your presentation on WAM, Brian. Um, to the audience, we have about 14 minutes to answer questions, so please continue to type them in the questions chat box on the right side, and I'll read them to our speakers. Uh, Tim Miller will be joining us for the Q&A uh, to also answer any questions. Um, and also, if you are interested in the slides that Brian just showed you, we do have them available, so go to the right. Uh, click on, on the handouts menu and you can download the PDF. What Before we answer, I, I read the first questions, I just wanted to do a quick plug for the library. Uh, please help us determine the future of the NOAA Library Network by completing our survey, which is active from January 6th through the 22nd. If you're a NOAA employee or contractor, check your email for the survey link and thank you in advance. So we do have some quick questions coming in here, Brian. Um, let me go ahead and read the first one. Uh, the first one asks, is the selectivity on uh, page 31 of your slides for surveys or fisheries? Uh, for either. Okay. So yeah, in, in the model we have um, this one, I'm oh, sorry, this uh, specific example is for the fishery, but um, you can specify uh, the 2D AR1 process on on selectivity for fishery or for indices. Well, thank you. Um, the next question asks, would you explain a positive process deviation estimated for the numbers at age for ages greater than one as evidence for immigration to the modeled stock? Uh, can you repeat that, please? Sure. Uh, would you explain a positive process deviation estimated for the numbers at age for ages greater than one as evidence for immigration to the modeled stock? Um, let's see, process. So the, um, it depends. Um, so if you, if the only random effect or the only um, process you're treating as a random effect is, are, are the survival transitions, like numbers at age, um, it could be that it's uh, natural mortality is misspecified. It could be fishing mortality or selectivity. There's a few things that are potentially confounded in there. It also could be uh, emigration or immigration. Um, if you also, like say for this example that I put back up on the screen, um, if you are independently also estimating deviations in M, that's probably less likely to be the case, that a positive, so say in um, this model here on the right, where you have, you're allowing deviations in M separately, but then you also have deviations in the numbers of age, then I'd say that's more likely to be emigration than if you did, if you weren't also uh, estimating deviations in M. Does that make sense? Great. Um, the next uh, question is also a comment. It says, great talk. A few years ago, Chris Legault wrote a paper on considerations when estimating time varying M in assessments. Do you have general advice for what cases in which estimating time varying M should be pursued? Uh, I don't, no, um, unless Tim wants to um, I mean, I guess I guess it would be where you would, because um, there's definitely the room for some confounding with other um, in the non-time varying process or process that you aren't treating as time varying that maybe um, it would seem to be prudent if to look at that if you do have some biological reason for suspecting there to be a time varying natural mortality. Um, 
that's I guess the short and easy answer. <laughs> Okay. Um, the next question asks, if you're looking at models with time varying abundance and time varying natural mortality, are you assuming that all changes in the abundance are coming from fishing mortality? I'm happy to repeat the question if you need me to. Um... Yeah, why don't you repeat it? Sure. Um, if you're looking at models with time varying abundance and time varying natural mortality, are you assuming that all changes in the abundance are coming from fishing mortality? Um, I would say that if you are not, if, so this example again, I have up on the screen. If you, this is a state space model where there's deviations in the transitions and numbers at age. If you have a, uh, a non state space model, that would be true that you're, um, you're only estimating the DV, uh, you're estimating F in every year. Um, but here, if you have uh, deviations in the numbers at age, these can be. Uh, this could be related to F or it could be related to M or it could be related to immigration and immigration. Okay. Um, next question asks, attributes related to Mohn's row should be evaluated relative to the extent that new data become downweighted, i.e. how do observation and process errors change, increase? relative to input variances slash CVs? And again, let me know if I, I should repeat that. Uh, yeah, why don't you repeat that, please? Sure. Attributes related to Mohn's row should be evaluated relative to the extent that new data become downweighted, i.e., how do observation and process errors change slash increase relative to input variances CVs. Um, yeah, I mean, you can look at that in these models. I'm not sure what else to say. I mean, you can you can look at how those change um, under under the different models. Okay. <laughs> I trust you on this. Uh, great. Um, I do have a, a couple of questions from another gentleman. Uh, he asks, did we apply this model to any forage species, for example, herring or mackerel? Uh, we have, uh, yeah, so two, one of the stocks that we have included in the, um, the WAM description paper is Icelandic herring. Um, and another is butterfish, which is like semi, semi pelagic, semi demersal. Hey, um, the the same person asks. It's great that you're accounting for environmental variability in M. Did we uh, did any attempt to count for predation mortality in the mechanistic variant of the model? Um, I guess you could do that if you, I mean, if you had like an index of predation, you could, in, you could include that as the, would have been calling the environmental covariate. It doesn't have to be like a physical variable. It could also be a biological variable, like uh, some, some index of predation pressure, or abundance of another, of abundance of a predator or, or something like that. Okay. Um, next question asks, do your cold pool observation variance estimates come from bootstrapping? Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't, um, those were generated by the physical oceanographers, so I'm not exactly sure um, how they came up with those. I think it's related to collapsing um, spatial temporal data into one yearly estimate. I think that's how they were getting the 
the estimates of observation error. Okay. So uh, the next question asks, with regards to future research for environmental studies and species, do you have the southeastern region of the Atlantic Ocean for microplastics and species migration patterns? Um, anything that would be included in WAM would have to have a clear hypothesized impact on one of the population dynamics processes. So something, one of those productivity processes like uh, like this list here. So you'd have to have a specific uh, hypothesis that survival or mortality or recruitment or growth or something was impacted by some other environmental variable. Um, and then you could look at that using WAM. Um, but it's, quite difficult to a lot of the time you don't have a uh, clear um, just identifying those mechanisms is, is a lot of work and it's um, it's not easy to do okay and this looks like it might be the last question unless people would like to add some more questions this last question asks you mentioned the Gulf Stream index but you showed only cold pool did you use any Gulf Stream index Um, I was just showing an example using the cold pool. Um, let's see. Um, so this this paper here that I highlighted um, by Haikun Shu um, used the used the Gulf Stream index. Uh, it tested whether it'd be better to use the Gulf Stream or the cold pool, and a couple other environmental indices as well. Um, so yeah, I was just showing the cold pool as an example, but um, Specifically for Yellowtail Flounder, they've looked at um, multiple um, environmental indices affecting recruitment. Great. An another question just popped into the box. It asks, do you have an example where assessment data are missing in some years? Um, WAM requires that you have the total catch in every year. Um, if that's what we mean by assessment data. Um, maybe yeah, but otherwise, can yeah, like so in. indices, can you hear me? Indices um, and, you know, age composition for either surveys or or the commercial catch can be missing and in, in, in given in you know, some subset of years. Um, and this, you know, this is actually going to be an issue in the Northeast with, um, well, maybe in lots of places where the surveys um, not being conducted uh, during the COVID era. Um, and then there's other years where we had reduced or non-existent indices for some stocks um, when the when our vessel is broken down or, or you know, otherwise um, un unavailable. So that, that happens. Excellent. Oh, and one last question popped in. Um, is WAM compatible with the data sets in Python for GitHub repositories used by researchers? Uh, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. Um, it is, it's an R package, so you'd have to, I mean, you just would have to get your, your data into R um, somehow. So it's not really, no, it's not compatible with Python. I guess maybe they're talking about like specific, like a sort of standard file format for, for data. And I don't, I mean, I mean I think, no, it doesn't right now, but um, there is, I think, a, a push um, for trying to do that in a sort of a national level. Excellent. A, a couple of uh, items just crept in and then we'll have to uh, conclude the webinar. But uh, so the, going back to the question about the missing elements in the data sets, uh, he asks, uh, no examples of such a data set? And then, and then uh, there's another oh, yeah, uh, data set where we have missing missing, missing uh, indices. <laughs> like, so many of the stocks like that we, if we were doing this assessment using WAM in say 2021, there will be definitely missing years of data. Um, and, you know, like, um, 
even Brian even showed when we have missing years of environmental covariate data, then that, that is also um, dealt with in WAM. So it, it's a, it would be a general situation that we would have for a lot of stocks. Um, they, going back yeah, to I, the I do actually have to go back and check, but I think I just included that as an NA for that, that missing cold pool in 2017. I think you just included as an NA. Um, going back to the question about um, what, what you were talking about, R, uh, the person asked, would that be R for React? Python is generally consistent for data sets being surveyed and using Python. We, that, I'm going to forward uh, that I'm question. Sorry, I don't really know what you're talking about. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. What I'll do, I'm going to forward that question um, to you personally after the webinar and then you'll have it um, and maybe it'll be more clear when I'm not reading it. <laughs> um, I just I think that that that's our time. Yeah, sure, maybe um, can clarify. Absolutely yeah we this all uh, all this information all these questions go directly to Brian so he can review them afterwards. Um, but did you have any last comments Brian or Tim about about uh, Wham that you wanted to share or Um, not really. I just uh, thank everyone for listening, and and I think the code will be improved by more people using it. So I'm I'm we're happy to to help other people who want to play with it, test it out, um, and you know it, it can be extended in any number of ways, uh, but just up to how much time and effort people want to put into it. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, since this webinar was recorded, we encourage you to share the link with interested colleagues or watch the beginning of the presentation if you joined us late. Uh, you can find the recording on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel or the Library Seminars webpage. And I'd like to conclude by thanking Brian for sharing his experience and Tim for answering some questions, and as, as well as Kristen Blackheart, who's in the background for organizing the series uh, for uh, National Stock Assessment. And finally, to the audience, I, I really appreciate that you joined us today uh, for the Library Seminar. Uh, NOAA Central Library is very proud to present work of the new NOAA community, its partners, and you, we hope that you will join us again. Uh, please remember that uh, I will send out the PowerPoint to anyone who asked for it, um, and uh, we hope we'll see you next month. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you.